Thank you very much, Craig. Good afternoon, Canberra. I just kind of wanted to say that, seeing as I got one of, one of these that I tell you. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to keep this brief, seeing as I've probably got about 15 minutes, and I hastily prepared this yesterday, so hopefully it's interesting. No, it's fine. It's fine. Yours is probably better than mine anyway. So, um, so yeah, so I'm just going to show you some of the trends. Um, it's mostly focusing on stuff that happened last year, because obviously we haven't had much time in 2013 to see any stuff at the moment. Um, I'm a senior consultant at Delib um, in the UK arm of the business, so I help government agencies um, engage people, so in formal policy making, uh, in things like crowdsourcing exercises as well, and all the many things that fall in between. Um, I'm not here today to talk about Delib, so I'll put that caveat on it right at the start. I'm just going to show you, hopefully, some stuff that's, uh, that's interesting. So um, I was going to talk to you about GovCamp in the UK, um, which is a big unconference for people like yourselves to come and talk digital stuff for a day or two days um, and do lots of interesting things. But unfortunately, due to the weather, I did this instead. So, um, so I have absolutely nothing to share. I could tell you about sledging. I doubt many of you are familiar with the concept. It's good. This happens every couple of years in the UK. So yeah, so I did that, and then I moved on to this. <laughs> so I, again, I can tell you about snowman building if you want. That is a, that is a talent in itself. So, um, just before I kind of start, I think the title of this is a slight misnomer, kind of suggesting um, that this is, uh, or Gov 2.0 in the UK, is something that's just starting, and I think what I'd like to stress is that it's not really starting, it's kind of maturing. Um, it's becoming quite the, uh, the usual thing to do. So, I think, um, yeah, it's worth noting. Um, it's still kind of early days, um, but people are empowered to do things and to do lots of kind of variable things. And what is driving all of this is a phrase that if you work anything to do with the UK government, um, you will hear again and again and again and again and again, uh, which is digital by default. Um, I've put this gratuitous gov.uk screenshot up, but I imagine you're all quite bored of hearing English people talking about gov.uk, possibly, yes, no, being a bit smug about things. Well, I could, I could talk about that for 15 minutes, but I will spare you the pain. Um, the kind of, the reason that digital by default is interesting is that it was uh, based on a report in 2010 by a woman called Martha Lane Fox, who was really big on, ironically, Gov 1.0, so some of the, uh, some of the big private sector um, stuff. And um, this report basically suggested that because we have no money in the UK, and you are very privileged to have slightly more money than we do, um, that we should drive efficiencies by, by using the internet. And that agencies, so mostly within central government, but it tends to kind of spread out towards local, should use the internet as the primary way of delivering services and also engaging people. But crucially, it's about efficiency. It's all about efficiency in the UK. Um, what you see from that is things like gov.uk, which is obviously excellent. It's open source. It's user-centric. Um, they iteratively improve it. And also, it's all been done from within government. So I apologize for the people here who've heard all of the gov.uk stuff before. Um, what's really good about this is that this has become the kind of, um, I don't know, the sign-off that lets other departments do good stuff. So, you know, things like um, cloud hosting, which, um, which Darren mentioned before, um, but also lots of other interesting projects. What that has manifested itself into is lots of interesting digital strategies that came out just before Christmas. And part of those digital strategies and the bit that I'm interested in, and hopefully you are, is about consultation and, and also um, engagement, and specifically around open policy making. And this is a really big push in the UK at the moment. So it seems like there's, there's some willingness in Australia to do this sort of thing. Um, I wouldn't say I'm an expert. I've only been here a few weeks, and I've barely stopped. But what's nice about this is, again, it's being driven from uh, the Cabinet Office, so right at the heart of central government, who are also where uh, the GDS team, so the Government Digital Service are based, who do all the gov.uk stuff. What's so good about that is that they've been given a mandate to go out and try and educate people. So they can't force people to, to take part in open policy making. They can't force people to run consultations online properly. But what they can do is influence. So they put on lots of events. And they also are working um, at the moment with the Democratic Society to produce this kind of blog-based website. Again, with this idea that you can kind of influence people by educating them a little bit, posting up case studies, all that sort of stuff. Maybe, I don't know, taking the risk out of it a little bit. Um, and this is also something that Dilip um, 
should contribute more to, but we've been um, a little bit lazy about it. Um, what's really nice about open policy is that it ties into all the other strands that are going on, so the efficiencies um, and the uh, empowerment of people within uh, departments. So what I thought I'd do, seeing as I've uh, I just kind of bungled this all together after the disaster of GovCamp, is show you some interesting examples. And if anyone's got any questions about the things I'm going to show you, feel free to, uh, to jump in. Um, so one of the things that I quite like, which I've called new stuff, incidentally, I've put a hashtag on the top of all of these to make you feel more at home. So I hope you appreciate that. That's excellent title work. So um, this is something from Biz. So this is Business Innovation and uh, Skills, one of our larger departments. Um, and this is about using Instagram to um, document, uh, document making policy. So it's not really um, an external engagement exercise, it's more internal, but obviously this is publicly visible and I'm sure they promoted it on their Twitter channels and Facebook page and all the, uh, all the usual suspects. Um, so this one's from uh, the Space Agency. We have one in the UK, apparently. I'm not sure what they do, but yeah, we have one. Um, and the thinking was you just send in your you know, 70s photos um, showing what you do day to day. Um, what I think is interesting about this is the fact that it didn't work. And that's what you see a lot of at the moment, is people being allowed to try things out, trying lots of different channels, and also being allowed to, to fail. So would anyone like to have a guess how many Instagram photos came in five. for this? Do we have five? <laughs> Who's that? Three. Good guess. It was actually four, but they were promised five. <laughs> so yeah, you do, you do. <laughs> so that's for you. That's a, a cherished memory to take away. Um, so yeah, so, but it is quite nice. It's, it's not kind of formal policy stuff, but it's kind of interesting, I hope. Um, some of the more uh, legitimate, I suppose, attempts at doing open policy making are about pe getting people involved in, um, in draft bills really early on. So this is an example from the Department of Health. I actually made some notes about this. I think I have some stats somewhere. Is anyone interested in stats? Yes, okay, let's do stats from my scroll down writing. So it happened in July 2012. That's your, um, that's your first stat. And it got 283 comments. I should probably explain what it's all about. So this is um, an initial draft bill that they put up online. Um, as far as I'm aware, it was just um, a cheapy WordPress microsite um, that they, um, they bought from someone. And they split down the various clauses within the bill that they wanted people to comment on. I think there was 83 of them for, um, for fact fans. Um, and people could just come along and very, very basically leave comments. And you can see, not especially well sorted. Um, other bits and bobs that are kind of interesting, I think, are the fact that this is made to look like their normal site, but they've greyed it out. So this kind of nasty grey banner is an intentional thing. And that's just about keeping people's attention, slightly differentiating um, from the main the main site. Um, what is kind of good about this is that they did a lot of blogging about it in advance. They followed it on. And it's become kind of a nice, safe case study for other people who want to do this. The second thing that it's led to, and there we go, diagram for the first time. This is the only diagram in the whole thing, is uh, the idea of the public reading stage and, um, and letting people comment on that. So they're trying to build various platforms at the moment. Um, I think from a technical perspective, it's actually quite difficult to do this in any way that is um, easy for people to use. Um, I also think, despite the fact they're trying to say, we're going to open this up to the public, get them really involved in what happens kind of day to day, really it's only going to be relevant for kind of expert stakeholders, as far as I can see. But it's nice that there is this willingness to do this. Yes? That's a very good question. So no, no real strategy, and that is why things like this are getting really low response rates. So you see them held up as really good examples of how we're being very open, so kind of sticking to the open policy making ideas, doing it all online. But I think that's kind of you hit the nail on the head, is that it's very difficult for non-expert stakeholders to get their head around it. But also, I haven't seen any real promotion, and that is a reflection on the fact that the UK government doesn't really have a lot of money so you don't see as much kind of big national comms exercises. So, yeah, it's kind of good that they're doing it, but I think this is kind of how I was going to summarise. At the moment, it's not terribly well executed. Yes? Um, I, I find that really interesting. Yeah. Um, the way that, um, and, and that you actually respond to that is that your promotion is therefore a, a 
Well, it would, it would help to some extent, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah, well, I'm actually going to move on to some of the bigger kind of policy consultation stuff, and there is a lot of that, and that's kind of, you know, good but standard reporting. With this early stuff, um, that's the kind of the other challenge with it, is that you're getting a lot of vaguely unsolicited comments. So you've got the challenge of analysis. As far as I'm aware with these tools, there's pretty limited demographic collection. So, you know, all of the things you're talking about, are they from the same area, same socioeconomic group, whatever, you're not really collecting that information. And I think that's where the challenges lie. Um, it was the same with the Department of Health one with being just kind of a WordPress thing. It was basically just a list of comments. So there's no way of kind of aggregating those comments for one thing, and there's no kind of demographic or whatever information to collect. So, yeah. Any other questions before I move on? I'll take that as a positive. Um, so yeah, so there's a big push for this sort of thing as well, to bring people early, in early rather, in the policy making cycle, and that's excellent. Um, the other thing that we see, or oh, we saw a lot of last year, is online being the primary response mechanism for big public consultations. And before I came to Australia, I kind of assumed that that was a given and that you would do the same. I've met quite a lot of agencies now at various different levels, and it seems like there's still an argument to be made here, at least, to make online the primary response mechanism. And what's really nice for, for Delib and what we do, and for anyone that thinks that you should do this kind of thing online for various reasons, is that that big efficiency agenda, all stemming from digital by default a couple of years ago, has meant that people are very receptive to saying, this is how you respond. They'll still collect sort of other things. And also that things of such importance are done primarily online. So, there's no kind of perceived risk around that. Um, this particular example is um, the IndyREF. It's the Independence Referendum uh, Consultation. So it's just got a very long title, so I shortened it down for you. Um, and this was um, a consultation that the Scottish Government ran um, about the, the breakup of the union, which hopefully won't happen, but we will see. Um, and what was nice about it is that they are basically using the consultation to frame the question. So I put on this bloody great ballot paper here, and that was one of the questions. It's, should it just be, should Scotland be an independent country, yes or no? Which makes it a lot easier. The other things they were asking about were things like, should you be able to vote on um, a Saturday and a Sunday? And that's Alex Salmon trying to increase the electorate, basically. Should 16 and 17 year olds be able to vote um, as well? And it was nice because it was quite a short consultation. It was a very interesting consultation and obviously important. And I think it was quite well run. It was quite simple. Um, what I've also got for this is lots and lots of stats. And these are actually quite interesting stats. So they got 26,000 responses that they could use for analysis. They got some rubbish, um, some repetition stuff from campaign groups. Um, and 23,000 of that 26 were through this single platform. Or there isn't actually a photo there, but it's through um, a single consultation platform. So it's all gone into there. It's all gone into the central database. They had far less of this. Just send us an email. Send us your correspondence. And I think that's where the real value lies in using online for this, this more formal stuff. And like I said, again, it's about efficiency. They, they cut down on some of their analysis and the collection of stuff. Um, also, what's interesting is the majority of the responses were from individuals as opposed to organizations. And there was a real groundswell of support, mostly Scottish people as well, because the rest of the people um, could actually yeah, submit their opinions if you're from England and you weren't happy about it. Um, what led on from this, which was pretty enormous, um, is, so they decided that's not contentious enough, so let's consult on same-sex marriage as well. Double whammy for 2012. Um, this is kind of later on down the line, I suppose, in terms of they decided they were going to legalise it, and it was just about a few kind of bits um, around it. Mostly it focused on hearing from religious groups um, and whether um, various religious groups would allow same-sex marriage within their um, churches or synagogues or whatever. That's the limit of my religious knowledge. Um, and again, it's all been run online. Um, it's going to shut in March, but I think it just shows yeah, how, how stuff is just, how internet response, I should say, is becoming um, absolute standard uh, practice. 
And then finally, one that's, well, I think is uh, quite interesting is obviously a bit bleak, to put this on a large screen, it seems even bleaker when it's up there, is, um, is this uh, consultation by the Sensing Council, which is part of Ministry of Justice in the UK. Um, and I have stats for this as well somewhere, which I'm sure are really interesting. Uh, so yeah, so they're gonna um, deal, well, they're gonna look at how they can change dealing with 54 um, crimes that relate to sexual offenses. So I think what's, what's interesting about this is A, it's pretty historic. B, um, it's not necessarily contentious, but it's um, kind of a difficult subject to, to, to broach. And the third thing is that it's just so large. So they, you know, a lot of the time you'll be talking about one single very kind of specific policy. This is absolutely enormous. Um, in terms of actually completing this, it would probably take you um, at least an hour and a half and probably most of the afternoon if you had some genuine um, opinions to put in. And also what's nice is the way that they kind of promoted this as well, which is, I think is pretty important with any sort of thing like this. And they actively went out to the media, they went on to um, various panel shows, but what they did was they promoted the URL and, and that was it. And I think, even though that doesn't sound particularly groundbreaking or revolutionary, it's incredible how many people will still promote an email address or you know, go to our website and there'll be a postal address with all the kind of inefficiency that involves, yeah. 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 Absolutely. And what, what was quite nice about this is um, that they have all the kind of the formal policy documents or consultation document, whatever you want to call it, in place. But then they translated that into real English as well. So, which uh, crazy idea? They might have even removed the word stakeholder, things like that, which would be nice. Um, make a change. Um, and what you get when you kind of go through, so all of these lead to the various consultations, which are you know surveys, online surveys. And um, above the survey, well, preceding the survey, above the survey, and within it, there is contextual information, mostly in the form of drop down, so you're not kind of bombarding everyone. Some of that is very legalistic, kind of, there is um, the glossary of terms that goes alongside the very, um, the techie document, um, which is, you know, pretty important to put that in the public domain. And there's also kind of English that you and I could read, or someone who's not in government could read and, and understand. What is also good is the fact that they split it down into these separate ones so that you're not forcing someone who uh, only really knows a little bit about one section to go through, say, a 35-page survey. I mean, for one thing, probably nobody would actually um, respond. So, um, so yeah, another kind of, well, sort of interesting thing that's happening. And that is the end of my much, much shorter than Darren's presentation, which is either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your point of view. Um, so yeah, hopefully you learnt something, nobody cried, so that's a positive. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any questions for Ben before he leaves the stage? Yep, yep. the back, and then a couple over here. Um, if they can Yeah. The people that aren't online, they say, don't have any sex work. Yeah. And so therefore, it's expected to be able to do it. And they'd be sure to the last thing. Yeah. So, how, what's your idea of bridging that gap? Or yeah. I mean, there's some really obvious stuff. I mean, the first thing is if you're planning um, an enormous consultation exercise, regardless of the stage, it's about thinking about bringing in online right at the start. So, when you're planning, you know, how are you going to structure the questions, you know, the, the type of response you want. You know, it's probably going to be qualitative, maybe quantitative. You might have other mixed methods. Um, and bringing that in right at the beginning with that expectation. And that's certainly how something like the Scottish Government approaches it. They start with the online and then they kind of they disseminate that out. I think the wider thing about skills gap is, I mean, it's a tricky one. And it's about obviously getting corporate buy-in and that's not an easy thing. We're fortunate in some respects in the UK because we have no money we have to do things online, or there is a greater willingness because it's simply more efficient. And I think in terms of the people I've been talking to here in Canberra and, and elsewhere, that's kind of what I stress, is if you can make these efficiencies and they're proven, and you know they don't necessarily entail some risk, 
why wouldn't you do it? And why don't we talk about this slightly earlier on and maybe take some of the mystique out doing things online? Because it's quite a simple process, really. I don't know. I don't know if that answered you or I'm just rambling. Can I just add to that? Um, yeah. I work in an organisation that has AMBOs, two different types of fireys and SES. In general, they don't like each other. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't, but they, they have their own silos. The system we've built technically does the job brilliantly. The hardest thing and the biggest challenge day to day is getting them to feed it. We're as good as the information we get. It's exactly the same as everyone in this room who's in a, a, some sort of online job. They can yell and scream and shout as much as they want, but if they haven't given you the information in the time in which they want it up by way of deadline, you aren't a miracle worker. Um, what, I, what I decided to do, which works, is I went to the head of our organisation, the commissioner, I got him on board, and luckily he was, I wouldn't say web savvy, but he had an interest in it. Got him on board and he continually just handed it down to his chief officers that this has to happen. He went as far as, when he saw it wasn't happening, to make a commissioner's guideline, which is a law in the ACT, a set table in the assembly, which says they must alert us within two minutes of uh, confirmation of the following list of incidents, um, the duty media officer. So two minutes is either they get 10 calls, obviously there is something going on at whatever they're ringing about, or two minutes of getting on scene and going, oh, well, the roof's on fire and escaping in, well, obviously this is something serious. There's still challenges, but you need to get your secretary, get secretary, however it works, you need to get them on board, and the, whoever the influential people are in your, in your departments or agencies to do it, they don't necessarily have to be the boss, but there are people, you, you know who they are, they're the people that they say anything, and it's like the Simpsons crowd comes over, and it's like their God and what they say goes, and everyone goes with it. Go to those people, get them on board. I won't guarantee it'll work, but it'll make it a lot easier. Cool. And a couple of quick questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think kind of ironically, given what I'm talking about, it's still um, mass media and sort of the older channels, so um, TV, obviously, but also we have um, some really uh, popular kind of radio shows through the BBC, so Radio 5 is mostly um, discussion, and they'll tend to get ministers out there um, preceding the announcement um, of the actual consultation and talking about it, but tying in with the online in terms of, like I said, it sounds simple, but promoting that URL. Ah, spending challenge, good reference. Um, yes, yes it did, that was a while ago now. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of that on there. They also did um, stuff, well they did a lot on YouTube, so they filmed um, Nick Clegg, oh no, Nick Clegg was the other one, sorry, they filmed George Osborne, um, and that video was syndicated left, right and centre. The other thing that they did quite nicely, well actually it was executed poorly, but they had an iframe of the, the dialogue app that it was run on, um, on the landing page of the Telegraph in the UK. So you're driving quite a lot of um, um, traffic from elsewhere on the internet, but also kind of, and, and things like YouTube and traditional kind of media outlets. So yeah, but I mean, we're a nation addicted to our media, so it's quite easy to put things in front of people. And Wendy. There have been important developments in the post-based engagement in the UK, mm -hmm. in the Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, have you seen evidence of that movement sort of slowing down with the, well, I guess with the digital yeah, yeah. Well, within central government, absolutely. And things like focus groups, you don't get as much of anymore either. Um, but within local government, it's the, the opposite. So the big thing is participatory budgeting within local government, um, just full stop. And there's a real push for that. And that's getting kind of bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think for that local, hyper-local stuff, then that is really effective. You can obviously mirror that online, but it is primarily offline in terms of how that's run. Um, central government now, it is pretty much online, 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 um, w with exceptions, obviously, depending on the nature of the consultation. Okay. That's probably enough. Anyway, you can clap now if you wish. Thanks. Okay, thanks. thanks.